The New York Rangers blow it in the third period and fall to the Capitals 3-2 in a gut punch of a loss. We break down a disastrous third period and also talk about what's gone wrong during this current four-game losing streak. You're locked on the New York Rangers, your daily podcast on the New York Rangers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, Blue Shirts fans, to episode number 982 of the Locked On New York Rangers podcast. I'm your host, John Chick. So I want to thank you guys, as always, for making Locked On New York Rangers your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. And today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for $20 off your first purchase. And we are, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So the Rangers. Today, a little bit earlier, in fact, falling 3-2 to the Washington Capitals, had the lead or uh, at least did not trail for the vast majority of this game. Uh, bad third period basically gives it away for the Rangers. And as I said, their first four-game losing streak of the season, the first time they're really going through what I would call a rough patch, not playing good hockey, and again, facing some adversity. The good news there, of course, is that you have a chance to respond to that adversity. And as we kind of talked about in our last episode Probably not the worst thing for whether it's the Rangers or really any team to eventually go through one of these stretches, find out what you're made of, and find out if you can pull yourself back up off the off the floor, you know, sooner rather than later. And uh, again, if, if we want to be glass half full here, Rangers will have a chance to at least start to do that as soon as tomorrow afternoon. Uh, what is that now? About like uh, 16 hours from now, about nine o'clock at night as I'm recording this. So. Yeah, you know, they, they got a chance to, to turn it right back around, but they had to do a lot better than they did in this game, specifically in the third period of this game. And even more specifically, they have to stop making this same mistake that they keep making. And the everydayers, you guys already know, you can probably tell just from the tone of my voice, those of you on YouTube, the look in my eyes right now, what I'm about to talk about, this complete just trend of absolute disastrous play by the Rangers on the shift that follows a goal, or at least in the immediate aftermath of a goal, you know, the first two minutes or so after a goal is scored. It was one thing earlier in the season when this was happening every so often and Rangers would get caught a little bit flat-footed and uh, they'd either give up a great chance on the shift after a goal or they'd indeed give up a goal right after they either they had scored or their opponents had scored. Uh, the difference then, a couple of things. First of all, uh, they were winning. They, they were finding a way to win anyway, so it didn't hurt as much, didn't stand out as much. Uh, but also just the fact that at the time, it was early in the season. And so, you know, watching it, it's one of those things that was kind of driving me a little crazy. But at the same time, I was like, well, you know, this is, otherwise, it's a really good team. They don't have any other glaring weaknesses. Again, this is at the start of the season when I was kind of uh, feeling this way. They'll eventually figure this out. It, it's only a matter of time. You know, the, the title turn here, and uh, they'll get it together, and they'll be sharper in the uh, shift after a goal. We are now literally halfway through the season. That has not happened yet. Every time the Rangers score now, I basically have to hold my breath on the following shift, on the following, you know, minute and a half or two minutes or whatever it might be. And it shouldn't have to be like that. You know, you want to feel good after your team scores. And right now, I mean, yeah, I do. But by that same token, you know, if the Rangers score, are they going to give it right back? Or if their opponent scores, uh, are they going to allow them to have another one right away? And uh, again, it wasn't so bad earlier in the season because they were still winning. But now this trend is actively killing this team. It is costing them games. And again, I've said this before too. I feel like, I mean, obviously I've talked about it a lot. I don't feel like other Ranger reporters, fans, whoever, it may, nobody really seems to really lock in on this. It's only recently begun to get a little bit of attention, but the Rangers are just so bad uh, in the shift that follows a goal. And it happened again in this game. Uh, Rangers, again, you know, they're in the third period. They're up two to one. Haven't been perfect up to this point in the game, but overall, I think they've played a nice road game. They've done a lot of the little things that you need to do to hopefully uh, come away with a win and end this losing streak. And then it's all for naught because the Rangers just fall, to, fall asleep uh, for a period of, you know, a minute and 53 seconds there, or however long the official time was between uh, these two goals are scored here. And again, you know, I, I know I talk about this a lot, but it really is a continuous problem and it's hurting the Rangers more recently than it's hurt them the entire season. It's also a good time to remind everybody that uh, a couple episodes ago, I want to say like two or three episodes ago, I put out there, you know, I've, I've talked about how I've talked about this over and over again. 
And I invited everybody, you know, all the listeners, all the everydayers, anybody that listens to this show, even if you're listening to the first time uh, right here, right now, go ahead and send me of yourself an audio file with your thoughts on what's going on with the Rangers in the shift that follows a goal because I've talked about it quite quite a bit and I've actually already heard back from a couple of you a couple of you guys have sent in those audio files in an episode in the future I thought about maybe doing it tonight but there's so much other stuff to talk about that I'm uh, gonna hold off for now but yeah go ahead let me know what your thoughts are as far as the Rangers on a shift following a goal what the problem is what the solution could be or if you just have to vent that's cool too you know send that in uh let me hear it and um like I said we'll play those clips on a future episode but I mean it, let me also say because it's one of those things we, we've talked about this quite a bit. And so I got to keep figuring out, you know, ways to keep this topic fresh and different uh, angles that I could use to attack it. Right. So what we're going to go with today, I'm honestly wondering, like, is this the most frustrating, most annoying, most rage inducing trend that the Rangers have had uh, maybe in their history, or at least, you know, the last handful of seasons here, at least since I've been a fan, I was thinking about this the other day. And this is really bad. You know, again, the, the struggles that they've had in the shift following a goal, because it's just mind boggling to me that even now, after the four game losing streak, the Raiders still have 11 more wins than losses uh, so far this season. Um, they've found different ways to win. They're still on top of the Metro division, despite these recent struggles, all this, but they have this one problem that they cannot figure out. And I was thinking about some other trends that like really kind of got under my skin, really annoyed me. Uh, some of you guys, I'm sure will be able to relate to this because I'm sure you can remember uh, some of these things. Um, as far as like other bad trends, you know, if you go back to like the David Quinn era, and I'm not putting this all on David Quinn. I'm just, I'm putting you in the time period just, just so you can kind of know what I'm talking about here. But in the David Quinn era, Rainier team was obviously very, very young at that time, very inexperienced. They had a problem where they took just an ungodly amount of bad, unnecessary penalties. And even the Rangers now, they'll do that once in a while. It's not as bad as it was obviously back then though. And on top of that, it was always in the first five minutes of a game. The Raiders could never, never get through the first five minutes of a game without taking a bad, unnecessary penalty and just putting themselves behind the eight ball uh, right from the start of the game. Some other trends that I was thinking about, if you guys want to go all the way back to like the late 90s, the early 2000s, those teams were just chronic underachievers. You know, 97, they had that nice run to the conference final, but they missed the playoffs for like eight straight years after that. And just an underachieving bunch of players. And anytime that team, anytime you thought that they were going to turn around, anytime they came out and played the way that it seemed like they were capable of and got a big win, maybe knocked off a good opponent, uh, they would come back without fail in the next game and just lay an absolute egg, just an absolute clunker of a game, a complete no-show, and they would lose. And all the good that happened in the last game was basically a race uh, in the following game. So I can remember that really being a problem for the Rangers again in the very late 90s and, of course, also the early uh, 2000s. Uh, another trend that I thought of, and this actually started in 94 when they won the Stanley Cup, um, but for the longest time, they would always lose game one of every playoff series. So talk about, I just use this term, but talk about being behind the eight ball. I mean, it actually started in the conference final against the Devils that year. Um, they lost game one to the Devils in that series and fell behind. Of course, that was a series Stefan Matteau, double overtime, uh, winning that. And then they also lost game one of the Canucks in the finals, ended up winning that in seven games. But this just went on and on and on throughout the years after that. I mean, they missed the playoffs a bunch, but then they got back in and they would always lose game one. They would always uh, have an issue uh, with uh, just a, not a great start to any playoff series they were in. They were always having to play from behind uh, in the series. A more relatable or more recent trend, rather, uh, is the, and this one's a little bit more general, Um the over-reliance on their goalie. Igor Shesterkin now, Henrik Lundqvist for years before that. We've seen them fall into that trap. Different Ranger teams just kind of relying on the goalie to save their bacon. We've seen that kind of on and off for the better part of about 20 years now. Um, so that that's a trend that's always been somewhat annoying. Uh, I think one for sure that is uh, kind of popping up more recently is the Rangers constantly allowing their former players to burn them. And that's not just our imagination, by the way. There was a, a stat floating around on social media the other day and the Rangers, I, I want to say it was from like 2017 to current day. Uh, they have given up more goals or more points, one or the other. And it's kind of one in the same, but they've basically allowed their former players to do more damage against them than any other team in hockey. So it's not our imagination. It's legit. The Rangers absolutely get killed by their former players. Uh, bad power plays is another one for years and years and years. Rangers power play always was just lousy. 
even teams that were really good, you know, even teams that made deep playoff runs and, um, you know, were, were otherwise good teams. The power play was bad for years. I'm still kind of getting used to the idea of the Rangers having an elite power play, even though this is now the third straight year of it because it was so many years of just basically anemic power plays. But again, all these trends, all these like kind of a annoying, frustrating um, tendencies that these teams have had over the years, they all to me pale in comparison to the one going on right now. And that's just this utterly just bad play in the shift that follows a goal. I don't know what else to say, except that it has to be fixed. And that's part of the reason why I'm asking for you guys to send in these audio clips, because one of these days when I go to talk about this, I'm going to say, you know what? Let's just have everybody else weigh in on this because I'm done talking about it. I'm going to need a break for from it, uh, for, for my own mental sanity. Um, but yeah, I mean, definitely go ahead and send those in. I, I wholeheartedly welcome it and uh, we'll have some fun with it. I mean, we, we got to we gotta keep it light on here, right? You know, it, it is a frustrating trend, but I guess at the very least, maybe we can get a laugh or two out of it as well. But they got to fix that going forward. It, it just cannot continue to happen. I don't know how many times I've said that, but uh, at least one more here tonight. Uh, anyway, got to keep everything rolling. In just a second here, I want to break down what was a disastrous third period. I haven't even really talked about what happened on the two goals um, that were scored by the Caps. And there were some other things going on in the third period that were not ideal either. Kind of just threw away what was otherwise, you know, a solid first 40 minutes. Not excellent, but solid. Um, so we will get to all that good stuff in just a second here. First, though, we definitely want to let everybody know that today's episode of Locked On New York Rangers is brought to you by Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices. Show your total up front so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. Buy tickets in seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms, terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right. We also just want to let everybody know that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24 7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube, and subscribe to the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel. So to uh, go ahead, keep everything rolling here, I want to, uh, again, turn our attention to was basically a disaster of a third period. You know, the Rangers were up 2-1 to one going into the third, and again, it hadn't been perfect to this point, but, I mean, hey, you're 20 minutes away, 20 minutes of good hockey away from uh, getting two points, ending this losing streak, and having a chance to uh, sweep this back-to-back -back when you go back to the Garden back home uh, on Sunday. Um, unfortunately, you know, I didn't really like the Rangers start to the third period. Just didn't seem like they were uh, really on their toes as much as they should have been. They get a little bit of a break when Pacioretty uh, takes an offensive zone penalty, and that puts the Rangers on the power play. But the power play was not good at all in this game for the Rangers. You know, maybe a couple of chances here and there. Uh, Mika one-timer here and a uh, Panarin shot there, whatever it might have been. But there was never really that moment on these power plays, I didn't think, where it really felt like the Rangers were going to score. Had a difficult time gaining entry. Had a difficult time setting anything up. Um, you know, giving the puck away, having it cleared down the ice. I uh, just didn't really have any flow to the power play in this game. They went 0 for 3, and that's another thing. When you've got uh, a team right now that basically is just simply not going to get any offense at all from its entire bottom six, and on top of that, a team that's got one line that really is reliable offensively when it comes to 5v5 play, and now the power play has a game like this, you, you are playing with fire a little bit. They still had a chance to win it despite all these things. Um, but yeah, not not an ideal combination there. That is for sure. Uh, the Rangers do not score on the power play. Never even really get all that chance to scoring on the power play because Chris Kreider halfway through decides to take an offensive zone slashing penalty. Now, this was not like a, a vicious slash or um, one that's like like completely you know blatant, um, but it got called. And by the letter of the law, I would have to say it, it probably is a slash. And just an undisciplined penalty by Kreider there. You know, he's got to know better than that. He's a veteran in this uh, in this league. He's been around for a long time. There's just no reason for this. Um, and it kills your power play. 
The Caps ended up getting a one-minute power play of their own. Thankfully, the Rangers were able to, to kill that off. But yeah, just a bad power play on an afternoon where the power play was not good at all for the Rangers. And this is probably the worst one, uh, getting short-circuited midway through because he'd taken an unnecessary offensive zone penalty. So yeah, I mean, basically the power play ends for the Caps, that is. You know, they we had we had a Ranger power play for a minute. We had 4v4 for a minute. And then we had a Caps power play for a minute. We get past all that. It ends back to 5v5. And you get a wraparound try by Kuznetsov. Uh, he comes around the other side, backhand flip uh, of the puck toward the net. And he got down there. He reaches up, bats it into the net, 2-2 two two with 13-24 to go. Adam Fox had a really nice game, obviously scored the two goals and uh, accounted for the only two goals that the Rangers scored. I think he could have done a little bit better against Kuznetsov here, though, because Kuznetsov basically went in up the right side and just kind of went to the outside of Fox and just kind of zipped right around by him and went around behind the net. And I don't know, Fox, I just think could have done a better job, maybe cutting him off there, uh, maybe making it a little bit more difficult uh, for Kuznetsov to get to the other side of the net on the wraparound try. And another thing to mention here, while we're talking about things that have gone wrong for the Rangers, uh, they have not defended well against the rush at all in this game. And really, I mean, this wasn't like a typical rush because you, know, you went behind the net. You don't really think of that as a rush, but still, you know, the, the Caps sent the puck in from the neutral zone off the boards to Kuznetsov. Kuznetsov picks it up, he, basically on the rush, zipping into the zone. Yeah, he went around behind the net, but it was a, a quick hitting strike. Uh, you know, as soon as the Caps gained the blue line, basically the puck was in the net. Um, so it wasn't like a prototypical goal on a rush, really. But in a way, you know, it kind of still falls into that category, uh, I would argue. So uh, not good there either. The Rangers continue to struggle in that aspect of the game. And speaking of which... Less than two minutes later, of course, TJ Oshie scores to make it three to two caps and, and put the caps on top for good, close out the scoring in this game. And Adam Fox here, um, you know, this one, I don't know. It, it felt like he kind of got a little bit of a bad break on this because he basically went to knock the puck away uh, from Strom, who was coming into the Rangers zone. And he did, he got his glove on the puck, but then it bounced right back to Strom. So it was a little bit of a bad break, but, you know, still, it wasn't ideal. Strom gets the puck again, uh, picks it up in stride, heads toward the net. And at this point, the Rangers are in big trouble because they're behind Fox. You get Strom passing across to Oshi on the other side of the net. Uh, he's there for the tipping goal, uh, three to two caps, and yet another goal on a rush for the Capitals. And honestly, if you want to go back to the first period, the breakaway goal, I, I think it was Mantha that got it. Uh, that's a rush, too. I mean, it's a breakaway, but they're still scoring on the rush. So... Uh, all kinds of problems for the Rangers here defending against the rush. In, in that one, the, the first goal that the Caps scored, uh, Keandre Miller took a shot from the point. It got knocked down, got blocked by the Caps. Uh, quick stretch pass. Next thing you know, it's a breakaway. And, um, you know, the goal is scored. And uh, that one at the time tied the game at 1-1. One to one. But again, the Rangers uh, just not doing a good job as far as defending on the rush. And something else I want to do, I don't think we're going to do it today. Like I said, I wanted to give the Rangers uh, these two games against the Caps to kind of figure things out defensively a little bit and try to figure out what they're doing when it comes to defending the rush. Um, but, you know, I'm open to the idea of them, you know, shifting the defense pairings a little bit. We'll, we'll try to come up with some different combinations depending on how uh, this game Sunday goes against the Capitals, but it could be time for a little bit of a shakeup there. Sometimes I think you can almost become too comfortable with your defense partner, which sounds weird, but I don't know. It feels like these Ranger defensemen need to be a little bit more on their toes and maybe having a different partner out there with you, uh, somebody that you're not always you know, joined at the hip with, maybe that can help some of these guys a little bit. Maybe it just makes them just a little bit sharper. You know, we saw when Adam Fox was injured, the, the rest of the Ranger defense had really stepped up their game. You know, they really played well. Now, I don't believe for a second that Adam Fox coming back made this team worse, but maybe everybody just got a little bit too comfortable again. Whereas when he was gone, it was like, it's kind of galvanizing. You know, it's a call to arms. Okay, we got to step it up. Fox is out. We all we all got to bring it. And they did during that time. And uh, the Ranger defense, and, you know, again, just, just really struggling when it comes to to uh, defending the rush. So we'll, we'll talk about all that. Like I said, we touched on it just now, but we'll save uh, the meat and potatoes of that for a future episode. But then the rest of the third period, you know, obviously the Rangers are down now. They're, there's still some time to go here. You know, they've got a chance. Um, but Alexi Lafreniere takes a slashing penalty. Wasn't a whole lot here, but he did get him with his, uh, you know, his stick blade on the guy's hand. So I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's a little bit ticky tack, but again, I think by the letter of the law, it technically is a shift. Uh, either way, you know, there's about five minutes to go, and now the Rangers are shorthanded. And even if you kill off the penalty, which they did, um, you know, you're, you're still, that's two minutes where you're basically just having to play defense. They actually had a decent chance shorthanded. Um, Fox 
pass to VZ. VZ had a great chance. Uh, Ligren, who played a great game uh, for the Capitals, he made a really nice save there to uh, preserve the lead for the Caps. But again, just not an ideal situation when you're down by a goal with five minutes left and two of those five minutes, you're going to have to play shorthanded. Um, and, you know, obviously that probably hurt the Rangers a little bit, but they do kill it off. There's two minutes and 20 seconds to go. Uh, Rangers are, you know, in the offensive zone, a lot of passing around the perimeter, moving the puck quickly, maybe just not shooting as much as they should. Uh, great A scoring chance here, though, for Panarin uh, to Lafreniere. Panarin had the puck. He was on, you know, the right side, kind of in the faceoff circle area, kind of getting close to the corner there. And he puts a great pass in front to Lafreniere. Lafreniere tries to redirect it into the net. Uh, unfortunately, Lindgren is able to make the save there as well. And then with only about 16 seconds or so to go in the game, you had Lafreniere, Tamika Zibanejad to Vincent Trocek. Trocek tries a one-timer that just goes a little bit high and wide of the net. You know, as that play was developing, I was that that's the one where maybe I was thinking like, wow, we're about to score. Like it, it felt like if he really teases up and blasts it, uh, we'll have a real chance there. But Trocek was shooting from a difficult angle on that play. And Puck goes out of play with just 8.6 seconds to go, and uh, that was pretty much it. You know, the Caps obviously uh, won the game at that point. But, um, yeah, you know, it's it just uh, not a good third period. Pretty much uh, everything that could go wrong went wrong. They had the issue with the giving up the two goals quickly, uh, taking penalties as well, and I just don't think creating enough scoring opportunities. Uh, just a second here, though. I actually want to shift our attention to something that I was thinking about the other day, and I think um, you know, this recent – revolving door of guys being caught up from the AHL kind of shines a light on this. Um, I'm going to explain what I mean in just a second, but basically the long and short of it is that the Rangers, when it comes to their prospects, they're kind of in a little bit of a weird situation right now. And again, I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. First though, we definitely want to let everybody know that today's episode of locked on New York Rangers is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season has wrapped up but there is still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. Find bets in the new Explore tab. Make a parlay in the Parlay Hub the best way to find popular parlays and much, much more. And the NFL playoffs are underway right now. They started uh, today, Saturday. There's four more games to go throughout the weekend here. So it uh, could be worth a look. Just kind of throwing out some ideas for you guys. Uh, but once again, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, so let's go ahead and keep everything rolling here. Um, I mentioned a second ago, and you're probably curious to know exactly what I mean by this, and I'm going to explain it right now. Rangers are in a weird place when it comes to their top prospects, specifically their forward prospects, because, you know, the Raiders right now, you look at their roster, and I, I know there's some people that are panicking and they think the sky is falling, and I'll be the first to admit the Raiders have not played uh, nearly well enough in recent games. I do think, you know, the absence of Kako and Heedle finally catching up with them a little bit. Obviously not having Mika for the one game, that didn't help either. But the Rangers have a lot of things that they can do better and that they're certainly going to need to do better going forward. But when you look at the Rangers right now, they do have a real good team. There are some really, really good players on this team. Uh, even with the recent four-game losing streak, the Rangers have 54 points. That is the sixth most in the NHL. And again, we're talking about this right now after they've lost four to row. That's still good for six best in the NHL, and it's the third best in the Eastern Conference. And again, there are some excellent players on this team, uh, guys that, you know, can compete for hardware in any given season, guys that any given season can make the all-star team, uh, some up-and-coming players as well, guys that are, there's a couple of different players on this team having uh, career best seasons right now, and that's all great to see. Uh, they also do the Rangers. They have prospects that, seem to have really high upside, but the thing is, none of those prospects are really ready right now, and the three that really stand out to me, and again, we're, we're mostly, basically exclusively talking about forwards right now, but the prospects that I'm talking about, Brent Offen, tremendous upside there. Obviously, he was up not too long ago for three games with the Rangers. Always felt like they were going to kind of give him the Will Cooley treatment. I uh, felt like that was always kind of the plan, and they sent him back down. Um, you know, maybe we see him later again this season. It's at least possible. Stranger things have definitely happened. But for right now, it seems like the Rangers uh, seem pretty intent on having him play uh, with the Wolf Pack. So there's Offen. There's also Gabe Perot. I mean, the skills are off the charts there. Uh, he had an excellent World Junior showing, you know, just a, a week ago or whenever that tournament wrapped up. I think it was about a week ago. 
Um, and then also Adam Sakura, you know, former second round pick. They feel really good uh, about him as well. Just one of those guys with those never ending motors kind of players, you know, just plays every shift like it's his last and has some skill to go with it. But this kind of leads me to my point here. Rangers have a great team right now. The players currently on the roster, they have some forwards that have some tremendous upside, but none of them are really ready right now, unless you think that maybe Offman should be out there. But it, whether you think that or not, the Rangers, I think, disagree. So you've got some prospects, but they're just not ready. And it's the guys that are kind of in the middle, the guys that are technically one step away from the NHL playing on the Hartford Wolfpack right now. The thing is, the Rangers don't really have any forwards on the Wolfpack who they can call up and you would expect really much of anything from them. You know, it's it's kind of just this revolving door right now in the Ranger lineup, and that's what happens. Again, you go without Kako, go without Hedl for this long. You've got guys kind of in and out of the lineup a couple of times this season. But, you know, we saw Offman get his three games. Again, they seem content to have him uh, finish out the season with the Wolfpack, or at least that seems like that's what the plan is. Riley Nash, he's injured now. He was up for one game, but the guy's 34 years old. I mean, he's just kind of a, a veteran journeyman at this point. Uh, Adam Edstrom, I know some people liked what he did in his one game with the Rangers this season. He's also injured right now. Um, or he was, I, I don't know if he still is, but he was as, as of a couple of days ago. Um, but again, you know, this guy's a former six round draft pick. He's not really going to do a whole lot offensively. You don't think, I mean, it's possible. You never know which one of these guys could defy expectations and defy the round in which they were drafted. Um, but you can't really expect Adam Edstrom to come up here and be like a top six forward right away. I mean, that's not going to happen. You've got Jake LeCision up right now. Although I did see after this game, he was actually sent back down to the Wolfpack, but LeCision's up for a game. I mean, he's not going to do anything, right? I mean, at least not offensively. Um, and now you've got Anton Bleed. He only played five minutes and 21 seconds in this game. Uh, took a penalty, one hit, one shot on goal. Uh, I will say I did like when uh, Bleed stood up for Johnny Brodzinski. Brodzinski got hit from behind from Tom Wilson in this game, put to the boards. Brodzinski was bleeding all over the ice, and Bleed kind of jumped on Tom Wilson. And Bleed, you know, I saw this a couple times when he was playing with the Wolfpack last year. He does play with a certain nastiness, a certain edge, so I can appreciate that. But Anton Bleed is 28 years old. He's now played after today only 85 career NHL games. I mean, what are you really hoping to get from him? So, again, it, they're in this weird spot where there are really good quality, high upside forwards on the way, but it, it, none of them are really ready for it right here, right now. So it, it's all kind of a long way of saying that when it comes to, you know, scoring depth on this team and even really just depth in general, call-ups from the Wolfpack, they're probably not going to do it. You know, they've got Brodzinski on the team now, and I mean, he's all right. You know, he had that hot start. He's obviously cooled off since then. He's not going to play, you know, big minutes every night. But I mean, look at the names that I just mentioned. And is, is there anybody else? I mean, Alex Belzeal, you know, he, he's put up some points for the pack, but he's 32 years old and mostly a career minor leaguer. Uh, you've got other prospects, you know, Brett Berard, Ryder Korzak, but, you know, they're both 21. I don't know that the Rangers feel that either player is ready. And even if they are, I don't think that those guys are, again, you never know. You never know for sure. But I don't think that they're looked at in the same regard as some of the other Ranger top forward prospects as far as, like, high upside and ceiling. Brett Berard's a personal favorite of mine. I, I just like his game. He's got some uh, edge. And, again, I, I used this term a second ago, but one of those guys that plays every shift like it's his last. But is he going to get called up to the Rangers right now and, like, again, jump into the top six and just light the world on fire? Yeah, probably not. So, I don't know, man. It, right now, again, it's all kind of a long way of saying that the Rangers internally, when it comes to trying to fill out this this lineup and, and maybe get a little bit of a spark from a player on the Wolfpack, it just doesn't seem like that player really exists right now. Again, unless you want to just roll the dice with Offman and just throw him out there and say sink or swim. But I've seen that you know fail too many times with Ranger forwards in recent years to, to really want to go with that. There's part of me that really wants to try it there's part of me, though, that thinks, like, you got to figure this out some other way and let Offman develop the way that he needs to develop. Um, so, with all that said, um, it does look like the Rangers, again, there aren't really any internal options to call up as far as forwards are concerned. So, if you want to add some depth in general and some scoring depth, uh, the trade market seems like it's probably going to be the place that the Rangers need to turn to. Um, we'll see how it goes. Um, and they, they also have this problem of who is going to play on the top line right wing? There's been quite the revolving door there this season and basically ever since Pavel Buchnevich uh, got traded. And man, you know, hindsight's always 2020, but I think we're at the point where we can say that's probably the worst move that Chris Drury has made as general manager. I've said all along, and I'll continue to say, I at least could see the line of thinking there. But man, the, Pavel Buchnevich is, is lighting up. The, he's having great seasons year after year in St. Louis. 
Um, and you know, you you fill out your roster with guys like Sammy Blay, Reeves. I liked Re- Reeves wasn't making a lot of money, and I, I thought he came in and gave the Rangers some uh some much needed swag. But you give two and a half million to Patrick Nemeth. Barclay Goodrow is still here. I mean, they can't give him away if they wanted to. Um, and again, nothing against any of these players, but man, it'd be nice to have Pavel Buchnevich on this team right about now, would it not? So again, I understand the line of thinking that Drury went with when he traded Buchnevich, but in hindsight, yeah, I mean, that that is a trade that uh, has not aged well in the slightest. And the Rangers still have a problem as far as figuring out who's going to play with Mika and Kreider. Will Cooley got his chance today and he made a heck of a play. Uh, it actually led to the Rangers' first goal of the game. He was in there on the four check and, you know, just causing all kinds of pressure. He was chasing a... I think it was Jensen, the, the Caps defenseman, basically chased him around behind the net, chased him around in front of the net, and eventually stole the puck, got it away from him. Uh, pass over to Adam Fox. Fox tried to send a centering pass to Mika. It bounced off of a Capitals defender, went right back to Fox, and Fox buried it. But that whole thing was set up by Will Cooley, you know, applying pressure, eventually stealing the puck, and uh, getting the puck to Adam Fox, which is always a good place uh, to put the puck. So, yeah, um, as I said, it, it's... They, they don't have any internal options when it comes to, to fixing the depth right now, or at least it doesn't seem that way. Unless there's some diamond in the rough for the Wolf Pack that I'm not thinking of, that I'm not considering. Somebody's going to come up and just give you way more than you think he's going to give you. Um, I just I just don't know where the, the depth and the scoring depth are going to come from. Um, there are guys on the way, you know, but that that's a couple of years down the road. Uh, often I'll be up with the Rangers next year, I'm sure, but... Yeah, um, right now there, there's really no options. It's just this revolving door of uh, guys that, you know, are, are career journeymen at this point. And, you know, Anton Bleed, nothing against him. Again, I like the edge that he plays with, but um, he's not it as far as like, okay, we're, we're going to add some depth scoring to this team. I, I just can't see it working out um, in that regard for the Rangers. But figure we pretty much call it there. A couple other things to run through real quick. Once again, calling for you guys to go ahead, send in your thoughts to me on uh, in audio form on the Rangers their issues on the shift that follows the goal. Because no joke, that's what I'm going to do. A future episode, the next time this happens, or one of the next couple of times this happens, I'm going to sit here, I'm going to take a break from talking about it and ranting about it, and I'm just going to play all of your thoughts on it. I want to hear some other perspectives. Maybe there's some things that I'm not considering, some things that I'm not seeing. And I'd love to hear from you guys on that. Um, or if you just need to vent, doesn't even have to be anything like strategic. If you just want to you know, rant and rave for 30 seconds, a minute, whatever it might be, uh, be my guest to do that as well. Um, that's pretty much it. You know, again, I mentioned this earlier. I do want to do an episode in the future, depending on how the Rangers do in the next couple of games here. Uh, the idea of maybe trying some new defense pairings to try to figure out whatever's going on defensively and figure out why the Rangers uh, just cannot stop the rush in the slightest. And um, Capo Caco, man, this guy cannot get back in the lineup soon enough. The better the team is doing, the more, and nothing against Caco, but you just don't miss him as much when everything's clicking and everything's going well. I mean, you still like to have him in there, of course, but when everything's going well, it's kind of like, well, you know, Caco will get back when he gets back and he'll just make us a little bit better. Now it's like, oh my God, get Capo Caco back into this lineup because the Rangers are struggling right now. They're losing. They need all the help they can get. I know he wasn't putting up great offensive numbers before he got hurt, but be that as it may, um, he is somebody that will make this team better. I mean, you see the players that are in the lineup on a nightly basis right now and um, this revolving door that we have of Hartford Wolfpack journeyman players. Um, yeah, we, we need Capo Caco back, and uh, the sooner the better. Um, but yeah, I figure we pretty much call it there for today. Once again, if you guys would like to get in touch with this podcast, please send an email to LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Once again, that is LockedOnNYRangers at gmail.com. Definitely give us a follow on Twitter as well, at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. Once again, that's at LO underscore NY underscore Rangers. And definitely subscribe to the Locked On New York Rangers YouTube channel. Thanks again, guys. I will see you next time.